Welcome back to the Insights Policy Conference 2022. And this is our keynote panel. I'm so excited. Building an equitable care system that sustains and heals. Again, I am Ife Finch Floyd, and I'm the Senior Policy Analyst for Economic Justice at GBPI. So we started the day hearing from the about the perspective of workers and how they are organizing for structural change. Let's zoom out just a bit to a systems level conversation about care work. And for this conversation, I'm going to bring in a little bit more history. We certainly heard some this morning um, to set up our, our conversation today. So in this country, care work um, and specifically caring for children has historically been the domain of women um, and often women of color. And as I mentioned on the morning or the earlier part of the opening session, um, during enslavement, black women were expected to not only care for their own children, but also white children and also um, care for other enslaved um, black people as well um, if they were sick or ill. Um, and then beyond enslavement, um, strict gender norms saw that women saw women as the best caregivers for their children. Um, and this was women of all races. Um, and that idea um, uh, assumed that because women are, this is their natural work, that they should not be paid for that work. Um, black women often had to work, though, to support their families, um, and discrimination pushed Black women often into domestic work, like uh, being a nanny um, or home attendants. During the mid part of the century, Black women were overrepresented in these roles. Policymakers refused to provide significant resources in public day nurseries for working women, women throughout much of the 20th century, save for during World War II, where women were uh, necessary to the war effort. The need for home attendants rose after World War II. Since they were a desirable alternative to institutional care for the elderly and people with disabilities. While they were first coordinated by state and local governments, they eventually were, their services were eventually contracted out um, by private entities. And though home attendants, again, this is akin to home health aides today, uh, worked for private companies, in the 1970s, the US Department of Labor classified their work as companion services. And this companionship rule, uh, which um, exempted them from fair labor standard, standards, um, remained in place until fairly recently, 2016, I believe, is when uh, DOL finally changed uh, the rule. As more white women entered the workforce in the 1960s and 1970s, federal policymakers considered but failed to uh, pass a national child care system. And the National Women's Law Center writes that this was largely due to an anti-feminist backlash. In the 1980s and 1990s, federal funds targeted uh, child care assistance to families with low income. And the Child Care Develop and Development Block Grant was one such program. So while the CCDBG, the Child Care and Development Block Grant, represents a major federal investment, it has not been able to address the market failures of the child care system, which continues to have high costs for families and low wages for workers. I'm going to provide, um, uh, reiterate some of the statistics that we heard this uh, earlier today. Direct uh, care workers in Georgia, again, home health aides, workers in nursing homes, workers in residential homes, residential care homes, um, uh, about 93% of those workers in Georgia are women and about 66% of those workers are black. And this is according to PHI National. Um, and among childcare workers, GBPI estimates that in Georgia, that more than half uh, are, of childcare workers are women of color, and more than a third of childcare workers are Black women. 
The Bipartisan, Center, Bipartisan Policy Center estimates that there were about 14,000 childcare workers in Georgia in 2020, but that number has been declining in the past several years and continues to decline during the pandemic. However, those numbers uh, do not include women who are caring for children of family, friends, um, and neighbors who might not be a, a licensed child care center. So with that background, I want to introduce our wonderful panel. Jocelyn Fry is the president of the National Partnership for Women and Families, an organization that works to improve the lives of women and families by achieving equality for all women. Prior to taking the helm at the National Partnership, Jocelyn served as a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress, where she shaped and advocated for policies focused on women's economic security and women's employment and women's rights. Lauren Kuntz is a Georgian native and the president and chief executive officer of the YMCA Metro Atlanta of Metro Atlanta. She's the first woman president and CEO in the YMCA of Atlanta's 160 year plus history. Yay. Kuntz leads the organization's efforts to ensure that all people, but especially children, experience an equal opportunity to fully reach their potential. With a career spent in educational and health nonprofit development, she's committed to the purpose of making the Y a thought leader and a best in class provider of education wellness and youth development programs designed to strengthen Atlanta communities. Josephine Calapeni is the Executive Director of Family Values at Work, which helps state coalitions educate the public and policymakers about the importance of universal access to earned sick days and family medical leave insurance. And they do this through a gender equity lens. She was born in Malawi and Josephine has a seen in, in inequalities and inequities in one of the poorest countries in the world and one of the richest. As a social worker, she saw firsthand the systemic challenges families experience. As a result, she's committed to transforming systems and policies, including dismantling racism and toxic narratives of individualism, scarcity, and the deservings. You can read more about um, their bios on the Cadence platform, um, but please put your questions. We will have questions um, for this panel. Put them in the Q&A box on the conference platform, and remember to tweet using the hashtag insights22. All right, so welcome, welcome panelists. Um, and let's go ahead and, and get into our conversation today. Let's start with Joc Jocelyn. Can you explain the problems in the care economy before and during the pandemic? And how do these failures speak to the devaluation of the work of women, especially black and other women of color? Um, well, thank you, Ife, and thank you for the wonderful uh, introduction. It's great to be here with this, such a spectacular panel and um, for such an important conference. I really appreciate the work of um, the Institute and, and, you know, all of the work that you're doing in Georgia. And, um, you know, I think the history that you recounted um, is actually a good starting point for answering your question about what happened pre-pandemic and then what we saw exacerbated during the pandemic. Because, you know, the history of care and the history of what work we have valued and what work, what we think of as real work, so to speak, as opposed to work that um, is, is sort of dismissed or devalued. And even what we think of as the proper roles for women, all of that history is um, uh, rooted in what was happening prior to the pandemic. Before the pandemic hit, we had too few policies that actually supported direct care workers, home care workers, and really even that acknowledged um, that care work was something of real value. Those workers are typically paid low wages. They are overwhelmingly female, disproportionately women of color, as you recounted. Um, and that is by design and they are mutually enforcing biases that for years have meant that the wages were low, 
there were few protections, if any, um, and for the workers themselves, that they often weren't treated like other workers. They, they were expected to come in and sort of provide care for everybody else, but nobody paid attention to if they had a sick kid at home or if they needed to care for themselves, their own illnesses. So that was already a problem. And it was already in the problem, a problem in the context of an economy that overwhelmingly did not have the types of work family policies that really acknowledged that care is actually central Central to how workers participate in the workforce. If you don't have care supports, uh, you know, it means that you may have to leave your job if your mom gets sick and so forth. So prior to the pandemic, we already had that problem. The pandemic made that problem even worse, uh, you know, for all the reasons that we know. You had a massive disruption to uh, jobs. You had people losing their jobs. You had many people uh, um, uh, had illnesses that didn't have sick leave, paid leave. Um, so they were losing jobs because of that. You had all children at home, uh, virtual schooling, like it was a perfect storm, in many ways, a perfect care storm, right? And it, it, it highlighted, I think, with crystal clarity, the policy failures that led to too many people not having access to supports that they needed to sort of navigate, which was, you know, an, a, an unprecedented pandemic. And unfortunately, two years later, people are still navigating the same problems. We have had interim measures that have um, given moments and glimpses of support. We had federal um, emergency um, sick leave that expired and became instead of mandatory voluntary and that largely was ineffectual. There are state efforts that people have done. You know, there were a series of things that were done over time, but largely now families dealing with Omicron are struggling with the same problems that they were dealing with two years ago. That is a policy failure. And it is largely rooted in the history of how this work has been perceived as work not of value, work largely performed by women because it's their obligation, not a choice, not a respected obligation, a, a, a work that is low paid, um, work largely performed by women of color and women of color whose work has largely been devalued, which is why they have low earnings. All of that is how we got here. Um, and it was true before the pandemic, it's true during the pandemic, and unless we have the right interventions, it will continue after the pandemic. Thank you for that. Lauren, I'm going to turn to you. In Georgia, what did you see among your YMCA partners and specifically their child care and Head Start centers, but also community partners in underserved areas during the pandemic? Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for taking time to uh, join us on this panel. And I'm honored to be here uh, to represent uh, both larger uh, organizations like the Y that have early learning centers and small home and, and center based uh, locations as well. Um, in our work, we work closely with kind of the ecosystem of uh, small uh, home-based or smaller uh, early learning centers and try to really work together to provide resources, shared professional development, and other opportunities that um, some, you know, some smaller locations and sites can't, can't afford, quite frankly, or don't have access to. So we really do see the care system as an as a ecosystem. And you know, you really have to have all sorts of different types of providers. You need organizations like the Y that run early Head Start and Head Start programs in Georgia pre-K. You need um, centers that have more flexible hours, obviously, for workers that do shift-based work, so nighttime, weekend. Um, and then you know that, that different um, families uh, value different uh, scenarios. Uh, some do prefer, uh, prefer a friend, family, caregiver, kind of network, home-based center. Some want uh, something that is, is more in line with what a Head Start center would provide. So I think we have to acknowledge um, the very big differences across the models, how unique they all are, but how necessary they all are basically for the economic engine of our country. 
child care is so critical to um, the economics of, of our communities, our cities, our states, and, and not valuing child care and the need for a quality affordable child care is a huge issue in, in the future of our communities economically. Um, and so I think one of the things that I want to acknowledge at first is that I think there has long been a perception that working within early child care is not as um, respected as working in the K through 12 space. And I think that's something that we need to continue to lift up. All of the research shows the importance of early brain development, early literacy, um, you know, all of these pieces that are critical to that goal of getting children on a path to read to learn by third grade, right? We know those statistics of what happens if you're not on grade level in third grade. And so early learning and quality early learning focused on literacy is a really critical component of making sure that barriers are removed for children, especially those in under-resourced communities that may start kindergarten with a word gap unless they're in high quality early educa education centers. So I think it's really important that we value the work in early education, that we lift it up and that we professionalize it. And so I think I, I wanna make that statement because I think you know, that's, that's something that we see. Um, and how do, we, how do we not professionalize it and how do we not honor that? I mean, it's, it's obviously in the pay difference. And I'm, I know later we're gonna talk about the economics and kind of the structure uh, of, of some of these systems and what drives uh, low pay in some cases. Um, so I think that's it's a critical to acknowledge that and to know that that's just not the case. It is a critical time in child development and it's critical that we have um, leaders in this space who are professionalized and respected and lifted up for the work that they do. One of the things that we saw in our own centers, as well as in uh, partner centers uh, that we work with, was really that early learning and um, care providers were not being referred to, at least early in the pandemic, as frontline workers. And the reality is that unless you had those caregivers, we didn't have people who could go to hospitals and be on the front lines of COVID. We didn't have people who were out, you know, doing the jobs that we need them to do every day that we can't do remotely, whether that's uh, EM, you know, EMS services or firefighters or police officers. You know, I think it was only months and months later when you began to hear people talking about the necessity of childcare and, and bringing that into that conversation. But I think there was a frustration of not being acknowledged in as a frontline worker, which is exactly what our child care workers were during that time and what they are every single day. Again, it's a key critical block in how everything we do uh, works. And um, I think, you know, the number, and correct me if, if somebody has a different one, but it's my understanding that behind rent or a mortgage, child care is the most expensive uh, cost for someone. And so making sure, again, that people have access to quality, affordable care uh, keeps people working. Uh, and it also ensures that children have uh, obstacles removed. I also saw a lot of fear because our child care and early uh, learning center employees were frontline employees. And some of, some of the work was being done in person. Some of it was hybrid. Um, but there was tremendous fear uh, around obviously contracting COVID and, you know, that that ha did not abate for a very long time. Um, we're seeing less fear, although we're, you know, we're seeing it with, with the rise of Delta. Anytime you see a new variant, you see that fear come back in. Uh, and then, of course, with Omicron. One of the things we're really seeing as well is that um, the teachers and caregivers are really facing um, real challenges in the classroom right now. And like so many things, the pandemic didn't create some of the root issues that are causing classroom management challenges, but it exacerbated it. And so children are coming back into structured environments, having a really hard time um, with uh, kind of de-escalating conflict, acting out. And um, I can share with you that there's just seems to be this cyclical um, nature of kind of our teachers going through so much over the last two years, you know, being frontline workers, fear of the virus and contracting it and bringing it home to their own families. Um, the ongoing uncertainty of our center is going to be opened or closed, both for their own uh, job, uh, job 
uh, for their own job, um, for their jobs or for their children's caregiving and what that did. Um, and so, but now I think, you know, children coming back in with the trauma that they faced uh, over the past two years, one of the things that we're hearing right now is just how much time, how much more time that early learning teachers are spending uh, really focusing on classroom management and, and helping children even learn and, and make up for that. The other piece that I would share is that um, a number of our centers here in Atlanta are in under-resourced communities. And my biggest fear is that the pandemic um, didn't just create a shortage of uh, locations for quality early learning, that it created uh, a childcare desert in some cases, because so many of the small early learning centers um, were not able to stay open. I mean, many have shuttered completely. And so it really is um, very scary when you start to think about the impact that has and the ripple effect of childcare centers closing down completely because uh, of the various factors of the economics of it, not being able to find staff, uh, which is a huge challenge in the childcare industry right now. Um, I know, you know, as, as many know, the year of the great resignation, um, but this has been a time where, um, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of people opt out of this space for all the reasons we're talking about. Uh, fear, low pay, um, not being respected in their profession and having now opportunities to go do something else. And so I think we're, we're really at a, a critical juncture in terms of how we think about the ecosystem of care for caregivers. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Josie, what do these uh, broken systems mean for families broadly? And for the families of care workers specifically, right? We've heard uh, people leaving the care work. We've heard, again, struggles with uh, for uh, around paid leave. Could you just talk a little bit about what uh, how families are experiencing this? Yes, Ife, thanks uh, for having me. And so great to see Jocelyn and good to be with you, Lauren. Um, such an important conversation. Um, the one thing that I want to sort of bring all of our minds back to, especially folks who are participants and in the audience, is that we're talking about impact to all of our families, um, all of our communities. We're talking about our neighbors, your siblings, your aunt, um, the person who has to drop off their, you know, your best friend who has to drop off their kid at a daycare center or can't go to work because their daycare center is closed. So, you know, sometimes in these conversations, it's easy to sort of project and make it feel like we're talking about those folks over there and those families over there. Um, but when I read statistics that say that most middle class families are an unexpected $400 expense away from financial crisis, that's all of us. <laughs> that's our neighbor, our sibling, our moms, our, you know, our friends, our best friends. So it's important for us to sort center everything we're hearing and the fact that this is our families, this is us, these are the folks closest to us, and it's the folks over there, right? So in essence, it's sort of all of us, and I think that's really important to know. So when I think about it like that, when I think about the impact of broken systems to families in general, I think about my own family. So mm -hmm. I'm the oldest of six. I have the most flexible job out of all of us. I'm a childless but working adult, um, but when my mom needs care, um, and I am the first person that's expected to show up. And that often means potentially working a half day and canceling all of my meetings, right? So it is career disruption, it's work disruption. It often means having to fly from Maryland to Illinois. It often means having to coordinate. If one of my other siblings is able to be on the ground and in person with my mom, it often means me being on a work meeting while coordinating prescription pickup, right? So there are all of these sort of um, disruptions to, to our lives as families because our broken um, care, because our care system is so broken and so um, fractured in that way. 
I'll also never forget being um, being at a hearing in Oregon and hearing a 63 uh, year old caregiver of a spouse and a disabled adult child say that he never expected to see himself on Medicaid and even being on Medicaid still meant that he wasn't getting the services that he needed. He wasn't able to provide additional care for his grandchildren, which his child depended on him and his wife to provide that supplemental care. Um, so not only did he, because of the care he needed to provide for his wife, zero out their savings, but then found themselves on Medicaid when they thought they had done everything right. This zeroing out of savings meant that he needed to work a little bit longer, right, than he had planned. It also meant that the supplemental caregiving that he was providing for his grandchildren, he couldn't do anymore because he was now filling in the gap for the care that his wife couldn't get. So when we talk about the, this like interconnected care infrastructure and the impacts that it has on our families, it can both be the long-term impacts because of disability. It can also be the overnight things that many of our families experience because of the pandemic, because of an accident, because of illness, that all of a sudden destabilizes families that once thought they were on a, on a you know, economic and financial plan to wellness. So this disruption is critical, not just for how our families feel day-to-day -day life and day-to-day -day expenses, but it also has impacts on our economies, right? If our families are financially destabilized, folks and folks can't work, that has long-term impacts on our state and national economy. So then when we take all of that, right, and apply the lens of care workers, right, apply the profile of care workers, one of the fastest growing industries in this country and yet the lowest paid industries, we are magnifying the existing problems that I'm just talking about. So if we have the average middle class family can't afford a $400 unexpected expense, and now you're talking about some of the lowest paid workers in our country, um, though those impacts are huge. The other thing that I want to just highlight is that we have to think about all of these issues and their multi-generational impacts, right? So when I think about, um, you know, when I think about um, aging adults, I talk to so many seniors who did everything they could to try and do it right, right? So this was, you know, investing in uh, life insurance and putting away money in pensions and investing in long-term care insurance, thinking that that would, you know, provide the coverage that they needed, um, really hope, you know, thinking that Medicaid or thinking that Medicare would cover everything that they needed, right? Only to get to that place in life and find that the cost of care and the cost of living has outpaced our ability to save, has outpaced our earnings, and often means that then you have a second generation supporting the care and living of that first generation. That means me as the parent, uh, me as the child of a parent who zeroed out her savings to care for her partner, it means that now my savings are going towards the care of that parent, right? So there's these generational disruptions that we have to think about when we think about the impacts of our broken care infrastructure. Um, and it's really critical that we also think about what it means for working people of color, particularly working um, Black women who tend to be the primary breadwinners in their households. Um, and we have to think about the impact of the, what our other existing systems have on the care industry. So if we know, for example, that the care industry is a majority women, majority women of color, majority immigrants, we also have to overlay these conceptual care issues with a broken immigrant, with a broken immigration infrastructure, right? So it's sort of like, it's sort of like walking on tectonic plates that are constantly shifting under our feet all the time and hoping and you know crossing fingers and wishing on falling stars that somehow we get to a place where individuals and families get it right and the reality is i see over and over and over again that no matter how much you do as an individual no matter how much you do as a family unit on our own we can't get it right so there have to be state and federal policy fixes that come up and undergird all of the efforts that we are making as individuals and families to make sure that we are economically sound. 
Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for really elevating and crystallizing the interconnectedness between the care, care work and care economy and really all our lives and, and the uh, all of society really. Um, so we, we've discussed the problem or the problems. Let's transition a bit to um, thoughts about solutions and looking forward. So I'm going to, um, I have a question, but I would like all of you to respond to it from your respective perspectives. Um, so what would valuing the care infrastructure look like? What changes could public systems make to improve the sector for both providers, staff, children, and families? So I'm going to start, Lauren, I'm gonna start with you um, and then we can do Josie and then Jocelyn. Right. Um, so I'll start with just the economics of child care centers, specifically um, how they don't work in most scenarios, unless you um, are <laughs> doing very, very well financially. Right. So you have uh, certain centers that are going to do well because you have people who can afford to pay that high cost of quality child care. And uh, again, that's a that's a, a slice of the pie. But the bigger challenge that we face is that in under-resourced communities, the economics of running early learning centers do not work unless you have some level of federal or state subsidy. So for instance, in a situation like the Y, we have both early learning centers that are uh, early, Head Start, early Head Start, have some Georgia pre-K, which is funded. Um, and then we have some that are fee for service, although we raise philanthropy to subsidize those. Um, so, you know, the economics, we're able to pay our teachers well uh, and competitively because of the funding that we receive through Head Start. That's one of the great things about a program like Head Start. We're able to create equity and pay. We're able to drive, um, you know, quality in our programs. But if you are not, if you're a small, I'm just going to say if you're um, a small uh, female-led home-based center, and you don't have subsidies around that, and you're in an under-resourced community, you're going to have a very hard time even covering the overhead to hire staff, additional staff. Certainly, it's going to be very difficult for you to give them any sort of benefits. Um, it, the, you know, you're really talking about break-even scenarios at best. And I think that's one of the reasons that we've seen there's so much volatility that if you know two or three children in that scenario stop coming to your center or uh, a teacher quits, you're in a place that you might have to shut your entire center down. And that kind of goes back to what I was talking about in terms of so many early learning centers not having survived the pandemic. Um, I think it's you know critical to uh, think from a structural level how you can create subsidies for low-income communities, uh, for those individuals uh, and, and businesses that are running early learning centers there. You know, in the state of Georgia, obviously, there are some subsidies that can be received through the quality rated. But again, it's, it's, hard, you know, it's hard to go through a quality rated process. And so you have to have the support and the resources to do that. So I think, again, looking at it holistically and understanding that it's not as simple for someone just to put a shingle out front open their door and uh, and hope for the best. You know, there's around licensing, the costs that come with licensing, the costs that come with uh, the various, um, or even the time and the costs that come with the various certifications that you need, um, any professional development, all of these ongoing things. And then the economics of what you're going to actually be able to bring in the door. In some cases, it just makes it, you know, impossible. And in a lot of cases, it makes it impossible. And so I would say, there really has to be some level of um, subsidies for under-resourced communities to allow there to be uh, different types of models for quality childcare that everyone can access. So I think, you know, at, at bottom line, that there has to be a partnership with local, state, and federal government to to ensure um, that we have locations and centers for all children and all families who need childcare. The other thing I would say is that I think more, um, more support needs to go as we talk about professionalizing early learning. And I am speaking from an early learning perspective just because the why here in Atlanta is the largest provider of early learning in the state of Georgia. 
um, I think the additional support to help early learning teachers um, receive uh, bachelor degrees and other types of educational attainment and partnerships uh, with uh, state-based school systems around that is going to help us again professionalize the care um, fields and um, you know, really increase the quality of many of the early learning centers. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, when I think about the perspective of what value and care would look like, I think about it in sort of two key fundamental ways. There's sort of the policy and programmatic fixes that we know need to happen. Um, and, you know, we're all sort of saying value and care, but I think we have to be really explicit in saying that a big chunk of value and care on the policy and programmatic side of things is really robust financial investments that fix the issues and rebuild the structures in the way that we're talking about, right? So we can talk about increasing worker wages, we can talk about, um, you know, eliminating child care deserts, all of that requires money and to invest at the state level, to invest at the federal level, for that money to be invested well requires a level of political courage that we're just seeing in a really slow way. Um, and I want to highlight that, particularly the need for a robust financial investment into the care system at the city, state, and federal level. And I'm talking huge. And I, you know, I, I won't shrink from the fact that I'm talking huge because we need a financial investment that matches the current scope of the problem and the way the problem is snowballing into the future. So decades of underinvestment means that to level up in investment is going to take a lot of money. And we've seen all of the analysis that bottom line say that we can afford to do it and we have to we have to do it it's a front-ended investment that will show tons and tons of return of, on investment on the back end both in child care development in um, long-term and home care um, and home and community-based services and how we treat workers but all of that takes money. And I often find that there is a stronghold in how governments decide how to spend money. And that goes into what is being valued and what's not being valued. So we have to reconsider the value of care and what it means to a long term economy and and basically convince our elected officials that it is worth spending that money. There is long-term return on investment on the back end, and that actually our families and our economies are better for that investment. The money is there in a lot of different ways. It means rethinking our tax system. It means rethinking um, and shifting spending priorities. And it means sort of thinking beyond um, short-term and temporary and small fixes. We've been doing the short-term and temporary and small fixes for the past two decades, and we're still where we are. So we really have to lean in on the idea of spending and what spending looks like at a city, state, and federal level, and that spending has to align with our values. Um, so that, you know, there's there's really the, the policy and programmatic fixes that bottom line requires a lot of financial spending. Um, there's lots of research about what those fixes are. We know what those fixes are. <laughs> we need the money to actually invest in those fixes. So the policy and programmatic is one way of thinking about what I think a valued care infrastructure could look like. And the last part is really we we have to do some changes in our um, individual and communal perspective around what is valued in this country. And that has to mean a confrontation of um, stronghold laws that are founded in racism and anti-Black racism. Those strongholds exist um, stronger in certain states, high Georgia, than other states, right? So what does it look like to uproot those um, strongholds that are long lasting from decades of anti-Black racism? And how do we change our mental, emotional, and cultural posture towards things that we know aren't working? Because ultimately, if we uproot um, the roots of um, anti-Black racism and ensure that care uh, that care infrastructure works for everyone, particularly Black working women, then we'll ensure that um, we have a care infrastructure that works for everyone. 
Um, and I will just uh, pick up uh, where Lauren and Jesse uh, left off and just add a couple of points. You know, I, um, I couldn't agree more with, um, you know, their comments and particularly where Jesse ended. And I think the important thing for us to think about is that, um, you know, care is clearly essential to our ability to sort of function in society. Um, but what has been clear over the pandemic, and this was true before the pandemic, is that the people who actually perform the care are people that we think too little about. And a lot of times when people ask the question about how do you show to, how you value care, I start by saying it, um, it's not so much correcting infrastructure as creating the infrastructure. Part of the problem is that we lack the infrastructure necessary to really support the care needs um, of families and workers across the country. We just have relied on women, largely disproportionately women of color, to make it work. So when you talk about what a value in care would look like, it is sort of investing in the infrastructure necessary to really support care. It is, you know, increased dollars um, for home care, um, home and community-based services to actually make sure that we're paying people decent wages. If you, um, you know, look at some of the proposals around Build Back Better, it is investing in um, to give more money to states around Medicaid, where a lot of the payment for home care services, direct care workers, goes um, seniors and, and um, people with disabilities access their care that way. And so this would effectively raise um, the matching funds that states get, it would help raise wages and do the things that folks are talking about in terms of giving people more money. Um, it would reduce some of the um, um, shortages that people are experiencing currently. It would help to boost the number of jobs that are out there. It would speak to Lauren's point about help, helping to professionalize the jobs. Can we put more money into the system to help with retention and um, uh, um, just the quality of the workplace? Those are all just sort of structural investments that we largely don't make because we have just relied on sort of um, uh, um, folks to do this work for low pay. And it it is largely rooted in our values around race and gender and assumptions about whose work is valued and who isn't. Um, you know, things like paid family leave, um, you know, those are things that it's really important, but you need to, to build a system to provide paid family and medical leave, right? Like those things don't just happen overnight by magic. The states that have been able to provide paid leave effectively have built a system. So I think, you know, to Josie's point, earlier, I'm really picking up on what Lauren said earlier, it is not simply that we need sort of um, the dollars, but we need a commitment to build the structure that actually supports a care system that would help folks access the care that they need, make sure that the workers who are doing the work are paid fairly. Right now, the average wage is $12 an hour. That's way too low for the importance of the work. Um, so that we actually have an infrastructure that supports care, allows folks who are care workers to care for their own families. Um, these are, it's sort of a no brainer. It works, um, you know, these are things that other countries do. We should be able to do them too. Um, so for me, a care system that is valued um, and strong is one where we have committed to making the investment to have the infrastructure that actually will work for families. Thank you so much for all of your uh, comments and thoughtful insights. Um, really, really um, um, wonderful stuff. Thank you. Um, we Please, if you have a question, type it in the Q&A box in the conference platform. And we have a, a question already. So it seems to me that while there are similar challenges, there's a significant difference between what childcare providers and educational institutions do in communities, as well as the roles of caregivers play when compared to, uh, to educators. Are there any initiatives to differentiate between the types of caregiving provided? Um, does anyone wanna start with that question? So I think it's thinking about caregiving kind of like in educational and, and childcare institutions and then um, the, the 
uh, caregiving outside of those institutions and, and what that looks like. Lauren, do you want to, yeah, or Jocelyn? Yeah, I, I would defer just because I think my the area of focus I have is so focused on early childhood and then after school, it's more kind of this wraparound, it's not beyond kind of the youth-based uh, work. So I would defer to uh, Josie and Jocelyn. Um, I mean, I, I'll speak to a little bit and Josie may want to add to it. I, I understand the point and I think there is a lot of truth that um, there, you know, all caregiving doesn't look the same and there are different, um, there are different issues in those different settings um, and the some of the investments that Lauren was talking about in terms of ensuring the overall quality of an educational environment and the early learning benefits um, are a little bit different than if you're talking about the average worker who just needs to be able to take time off if their mom gets sick or their kids get sick. I think in that sense, you are right um, that there are certainly differences. Um, and I think, you know, my view is that a care infrastructure would be able to make investments that meet both of those issues, right? Like we, we address the um, educational um, 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 challenges and to improve the quality of education um, uh, that's available. But I, I think, um, you know, on the workforce side, um, you know, my perspective is that these things um, are very interconnected. Um, you know, the ability to access childcare is critical for women in particular to be able to go to work. Um, so even though, um, you know, there may be some educational benefits that are rooted in childcare that are a little bit different than, let's say, access to paid leave, they work together, right? Like if you don't have one, then you often can't do the other. So for me, even though, um, um, you know, caregiving uh, may look a different in different contexts, um, really a lot of these supports are mutually supporting and if you don't have one you may not be able to do the other it is um it's part of the reason that if you look at a proposal like the president's build back better proposal that you know many of us have often said you cannot um, act as if you know one policy is a substitute for the other they serve different purposes and they serve different needs. You need to be able to, if you go to work, you need to be able to take time off to care for your family. If you have kids, you need to make sure that your kids are in a safe place. You want it into the quality educational experience. If you have a person who comes in and does care work for you, you need to make sure that those people are being paid decent wages. And those people need to be able to care for their own families, right? Like there, it is very much in my view, uh, um, I think Lauren used the word ecosystem, which I really liked because it's an ecosystem where you have individual needs that yes may be different but they all have to work together and if you if you have one of them that's not working properly it risks everything else being come, um, becoming undone um, and so from, from my perspective I think of these as all workforce supports, notwithstanding the point, a very good point, that there is an educational rationale to some of it, absolutely. But because all these things work together, I think of them all as essential for people to be able to participate in the economy, whether or not they have an educational component to them or not. So I, I hope that makes sense, but I, I completely hear what you're saying, that there are differences, but for me, they all ultimately have to work in tandem in order for the entire sort of system and infrastructure to work properly. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, just to, to keep keep on time, um, actually, Josie, I'm going to direct this next question to you. Um, do you think the pandemic spotlighting the care economy will have an impact on uh, policy progress going forward? The stalling of Build Back Better has me worried that we haven't learned our lesson. Chelsea. Yeah, that's a great um, question and comment. I mean, I have lots of fears about the short term national memory that our country tends to have and the need to want to really um, move past crises in a way that's actually sort of 
sometimes to me feels like a trauma response where you're trying to sort of like, you know, forget it or put it in a particular box. Um, I do think that the what the pandemic has done is is really shine a spotlight on care and the interconnectedness of care. Almost overnight, everyone who maybe saw caregiving as sort of a distant um, responsibility saw it almost immediately overnight. It was heartening to see the call for teachers to be paid more all of a sudden by all parents, right? So there was a spotlight put on that. The reality is that um, I think we're facing a tough political reality in Congress. And some of the things that we're seeing really center the, uh, the reality that inaction is really, really costly. And um, almost, almost to highlight this fact that all of our systems are interconnected, we have outdated Jim Crow-based Senate rules that are um, really catapulting the stalling of what we know families need. So the idea that... Um, um, Senate rules exist in such a way that would prevent the federal government from moving legislation that is both in response to a crisis and emergency, but in response to long term fixes that we know is in, um, in the, that we know are needed in the care infrastructure is really, really telling for us and is a commission on all of us to have really integrated conversations about the impact of our current economy on all of us and our families and what that means about how we vote our values and how we become multi-issue voters that are educated and activated at local voting um, levels, at city, state, and federal levels. We can't just be a nation that votes at the federal level in those moments. But the reality is, there's also the reality that if we want something at the federal level, it would have to be implemented at the state level. So who's an elected official, who's an appointed official at the state level is also important. So we have this moment that we have to figure out how do we not quickly forget the impact of what we were all feeling, the stress and the pressure points of what we are all feeling, and how do we hold people who hold the levers of power and who can fix the situation, how do we hold them accountable for doing the things that we all know we need and that we know that our families need. But don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Um. Ife, can I just pick up on one point? Because I, I couldn't sure. agree more with what Josie said. Um, I, I want to just add um, that I think that um, the public narrative um, at this moment, there is, um, there is an active battle being waged um, and a, an intentional effort to um, create a narrative that completely ignores what we have experienced. So I think, you know, the person who asked the question, I think is exactly the right question to be worried about, you know, have we not learned the lesson? I think there are a whole bunch of folks who want us to ignore the lesson and who um, it's when people talk about worker shortages and getting people back to work and, you know, focusing on, you know, we just need to, you know, open up the economy. Like I'm all for getting people back to work, a, a strong economy, but I'm not for sort of ignoring the lessons that we just, you know, that we have learned. And what we have learned is this is a product of lacking infrastructure. This is what happens when you don't have investment in um, um, wages and high quality jobs. This is what happens when you don't have care policies that support families. This is what happens when you don't invest in childcare. Like this is what happens. It's a big old hot mess. And and so it's important for, you know, folks in Georgia and anywhere else to weigh in with their members of Congress and their policymakers and to, to say, this is what I'm going through. And don't come back and say, this didn't really happen or pretend as if we don't actually have to come up with solutions that are responsive to these problems. And so I, I think this is a really critical moment because I do think, um, you know, we risk, you know, having a narrative that sort of ignores the reality of what we've been living. And that simply should not be happening. Another question just popped in. Okay, so I think we have one uh, time for one more question. I was gonna pull out one of my own, um, but that's okay, I got to talk enough. Um, so another one from the audience. Um, Lauren, I think the earlier conversation brought up the divide, which often happens between childcare, early education, and K through 12. 
Can you speak to the learning that goes on in the earliest years and how knowing that can, uh, that can impact the public support and funding for childcare? Well, you know, I think um, it's so important to connect um, research uh, and hopefully trusted research back to um, making the case for support for early education. You know, brain development uh, happens uh, at its most fast paced and robust before the age of three. And so we have a tremendous opportunity in the early learning space to help our kids, especially those who through no fault of their own, right, or are, are born into a maybe a particular situation, they have significant barriers just by the color of their skin, the neighborhood they live in. And so I think by looking at early learning and the ability to intervene at a very early age and provide the word nutrition and the literacy components that are necessary for the building blocks for reading, which again are fundamental to everything that you learn. You can't learn anything else. You can't do math. You can't do history unless you can read. So knowing that we have this opportunity before the child is three years old, as early as, I mean, when they're in, you know, in the womb, um, you know, talking, talking to babies, talking to children, pushing in tier two language, um, you know, really, really being intentional. We have this tremendous opportunity to educate all childcare providers uh, to be able to empower children through language acquisition. So I think in, in talking about that case and what we know in terms of brain development and uh, the facts around that, we have an opportunity to create that case for support for our elected officials on why investment in quality early learning child care and subsidies for a robust ecosystem are necessary because the investments we make in young children and in the care they receive and the curriculum that they receive um, is, is a major factor into their readiness when they start in kindergarten. And if a child is already behind in kindergarten, it it's even harder to have them catch up to that critical third grade reading level. So I, I think there is a very strong research-based case, a science-based case that speaks to why this type of investment is great for children, it's great for families, it's great for communities, and it's great for workforce and economic development um, because you, you end up with a better educated potential workforce. Um, you know, so you can link it all the way up no matter what your politics are. It, it's the science of helping um, children have the skill sets they need to be successful and own their own futures. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lauren. And with that, we are going to conclude this wonderful keynote panel. Thank you so much, Lauren Kuntz. Thank you, Jocelyn Fry. And thank you, Josie Calipenny, for your time, your thoughts, your expertise. Um, really, really thought-provoking um, and powerful comments. Really appreciate um, all of you. Thank you so much for joining us today. So everyone, we are nearing the end of uh, day one of GBPI's Insights Policy Conference. Um, please come back tomorrow when we will he hear from legislators, legislators and from GBPI analysts about the budget. The conference starts again at 9 a.m. If you would like to continue to connect uh, with conference participants today, please join our networking session, which starts in two minutes. I have have to hurry up. Um, we have three rooms you can visit, at, uh, the education pipeline, healthcare, and economic justice. Again, this is a chance to meet other people and have some conversations on related, related to these policy areas. And you can click on the networking room in, in the uh, conference platform. Additionally, um, at 7 p.m., we are hosting a grassroots engagement uh, training. Um, again, um, this will be hosted by Aaron Robinson of GBPI, um, Fanika Miller um, at Black jo Voters Matter, uh, Shonda Neal at nine to five, and Rachel Shanklin, who's at Small Business Majority. So please uh, join us if you're interested. Thank you all, and we'll see you soon.